we're going to do is split this into two things. Um, first of all, I do sales for a living. I've done it for a lot of years. I could talk about that. Well, okay, I could talk for hours anyway, if you know me. But um, I could talk about this for a long time. I think I've covered most of what I want to tell you, but I'm sure I'm going to miss holes. So this is not about me being unprepared, but this is about me trying to divide this into two sections. One is a talk. One is Q&A. I gave this at Mountain RB. Had a question that gave it led to one of the best things I wanted to say and forgotten. So. Um, the person that gets me to talk the longest with their question gets a bag of coffee. Um, and that is not hard, again, if you've met me. So I'm here to tell you about sales, to talk to you about why it's done, how it's done, what you can do. And I'm secondly here to tell you that Dave Thomas was wrong in his keynote. I do not want you to spend the next year learning a new programming language. I'll tell you about that in a couple minutes. So what is sales? Anybody? Oh, come on, you guys have got to start talking. Seriously. <laughs> Making people give me their money. Making people give me their money. And giving out candy, right? Well, that's part of it. <laughs> so, sales is not necessarily strictly financial. Uh, sales can have a financial aspect, um, and that's a large part of it. Sales is also not, uh, well, we'll go into that in a minute, but sales is about finding common ground. It's about education in a lot of ways. It's about people understanding that there's something out there that they don't know about, that there's something out there that can help them, that there's something that you have and possess that would help them get better at something, make their lives easier when it comes to DNS hosting, or when it comes to invoicing people for Blink Sale, when it comes to doing project management with Basecamp. Um, it could be product-based. It can be person. It can be a, a person that's actually telling you about a company, selling services. I started the company Edge Case four years ago, and I've been out there telling people what we can do for them. So it can be a job. Um, it's about understanding how to frame discussions, how to, um, how to put things in a certain mindset to help people, about understanding people. And it can also be about making friends. But most of all, it's about positive persuasion. It's not negative. It's not tricking people. So leads into, yeah, so I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'm actually trying to do this whole thing where I follow an outline, which, again, if you know me, is really weird. So forgive me if I jump ahead. Um, but what is sales not about? Well, first of all, it's not a zero-sum game. Anybody know what that means? If there's a winner, there's a loser. Exactly. What's that? By the same amount. Right. Sales is not a zero sum game. Sales is not about if I gain, you lose. People think that that's the case because a lot of time there's a financial aspect. You're trying to get them to spend money. Well, obviously, I'm getting the money and they're getting, doing away with the money. It's not about that at all if you do it correctly. It can be about that, but it's a, it's a, it's a positive sum game. Everybody can win and everybody should win. In the end, if you're not, you're doing it wrong. Okay. Sales is not about tricking someone. That feeling when you—and I'll hat tip to DNS Simple here—that feeling you get when you go to GoDaddy and you buy a new domain and you accidentally buy a used car, right? <laughs> that feeling when you go onto the used car lot with a certain budget and you come out and you've just spent three thousand dollars more, and somebody told you you're supposed to feel good about it, but you're kind of scratching your head a couple hours later, going, "What the hell did I just do?" Right? That feeling you get when you go to the Apple store and you come out smiling until you see your spouse and you're like, oh crap, I gotta justify this, <laughs> right? Um, but no, it's not about tricking someone. It's not about getting them to do something they don't wanna do. It can be, but it's not. That's the wrong part of sales. It's not about getting the most from somebody you can, milking them for everything they have. It's not about walking away going, <laughs> I convinced them to spend $10,000, they should have spent two, I'm good. Again, people can do that. Oracle's made an entire company out of it. And it's also not just one job. It's not always one person's role. Sales is always not always about putting on the suit and being the person in front. Sales is a part of everything. So, show of hands, consulting, consulting companies. Okay, decent amount. Product, who's working for a product company? Who would define themselves as other? 
Okay, what, okay, not both. <laughs> Who would define themselves as other? What? what? Okay. Okay. Okay, great. You make content and sell it? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So everybody here in some way um, is dealing with sales or has to be dealing with sales. If you're a consultant, it's pretty straightforward what you're doing, right? You're promoting your services. You're promoting what you can do for somebody for a certain rate, right? Sometimes in products, it seems a little, it seems a little different because, well, I'm just the programmer behind the scenes. But if you can't sell your job or you couldn't go out there and sell your product, you should quit. If you can't get behind what you're doing and what your organization is doing, you shouldn't really be there. Think about that for a while, and we'll talk more about why. So sales is, it's about persuasion, it's about education, it's about all of these things. But in the end, it's also about getting in the right mindset. In order to do sales, you have to be in the right mindset. Because there's a lot of baggage that comes with the word sales, okay? We picture the sleazy, sales, the sleazy guy in the, in the suit that, you know, comes in and, you know, convinces you to do something and you walk away going, how does he have my kid and why is he walking out the door, right? Um, it's not about that. It's not about that, but it's what we bring with it. It's the baggage that comes with it. So part of that right mindset is understanding some things. First of all, the business world in general allows us to eat, right? We are working during the day because, in essence, we have to. Most of us are lucky enough to be in jobs where we get to do what we really love. And there's a certain aspect to be said for, you know, in our industry especially, if I, you know, won $3 million tomorrow, would I be doing my job? Well, maybe not your job, but quite honestly, I think half of us would be hacking on something, right? So it's harder in this crowd to say, you're doing this because you have to. But truly, in essence, you're doing your day-to-day -day job because you have to, because you need to eat at some place, right? But business is allowing us to do this. Business is allowing my kids to grow. It's allowing me to go buy that guitar for my daughter that I wanted to buy and sign her up for lessons. It's about being to pay, able to pay the bills at the hospital, unless you live in France. Um, at the hospital, if something goes wrong, right? We all have to do it. A lot of us have this mindset that if we convince somebody to give us money to do something, it's a dirty thing. But truly, we all have to do it. They have to do it just as much as you have to. If you understand it's just a part of what we're doing, your mindset starts to change. We carry a lot of negative baggage around with us when it comes to sales, when it comes to business, when it comes to business transactions, when it comes to marketing, when it comes to these kind of things. But truly, we're all doing this because we have to. And other people are doing this because they have to. Other people need services. Other people need things. So it's OK. You have value. Another thing to think about, you have something to offer. No, this is not one of those Stuart Smalley, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. It's not that, but you have financial value. If you don't, you really need to quit. Um, what you have, the skills you have, help people in a meta way, right? We build things that help other people do jobs. We build things that help people get much better at their jobs. I was looking at, looking at proposal, proposing for an application this past week, ran, uh, ran up to a city with uh, Dan, our sales guy, and was doing some business analysis. And realizing there was one thing in particular where the system was set up in a really terrible way, and they had to input these numbers, and she couldn't find these other numbers, and you realize she's spending on average about 20% of her time on this, on this one little thing. So if we approve this application, and they're paying her state employee, I don't know what, let's, let's call it 60,000 a year, you could save them somewhere between 10 and $20,000 a year simply by doing this one thing. 
And that frees her up to do other things, to find improvements in what they're doing, to help them in other ways, right? Everything we do has this financial aspect but has a value to what's happening, and you're helping them. Understanding that you have that value will help you later on down the way. Because again, it's not a bad thing. Asking for money is not the root of all evil, like most of us like to pretend. So what should you do instead of learning a new language next year? I want you to go out and learn psychology. I want you to think about this. We love to hack on machines. We love to hack computers. We love to see how they work. We like to find their little intricacies and work around them, build tools around them to help them. But every single one of us has one of the greatest computers out there sitting on top of our heads and we have no idea how to use it. We have no idea how it works. We don't take the time to dig into it. We'll dig into the innards of any other machine. Some people here will go down to source code levels I didn't think I don't ever want to see personally, just because they're curious on how something's working, right? I love Ruby, I'm not gonna read parse.y, but I know other people that have. But then these same people won't sit and think about how we interact with other people. So there's a great starting point that we have in the geek community, and it's Pragmatic Thinking and Learning by uh, Andy Hunt. And no, I'm really not paid to talk about this book. If you've seen me talk in the past year, you're gonna start to think that, because every single talk I've promoted the book. But um, he does one of the greatest things, I think, and that's give us a starting point for understanding how the brain works because he gives us what's called a mental model. And again, he talks about mental models themselves. But he talks about the brain as being a dual core CPU with a shared bus. That's what the brain is. And what's fascinating is that under, you understand so much more about what's going on. Because certain things are processed on one processor and certain things are done on the other, because it's better at it. But it's a shared bus. There's communication errors that happen all the time. Right? There's certain things that happen because of this. Is this deadly accurate in medical terms? God, no. Although it'd be kind of cool if it was. Um, but it helps you understand certain things. Once you read that book, start looking into the field of social psychology. That is psychology and the brain and how we interact with people. Now, about four-fifths of the room out there, the introverts going, oh God, right? Interact with people, but truly, the more we understand about how other people are and the more things that are going on, we start to realize a lot of our fears are simply misunderstandings about what other people are thinking. They're also misunderstandings about what we're thinking. So if we, uh, yeah, yeah, cover that. Um, one of the things the brain does is pattern match. It forms patterns out of things in order, because we're taking in an insane amount of information. Every, every second, we're just, we've got tons of sensors that we don't think about, that we don't, under, that we don't know are there. And the brain is taking them, shaping them, putting them together, and putting, and, 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 and abstracting them. Giving us abstraction, abstractions, just like we do, right? Understanding that this happens, how this happens, why this happens, helps us understand some negative parts of that. Um, da, 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 da. Well, that's an interesting out of order problem. Um, the first part of this is in stereotypes. And if you understand what the brain's doing in stereotyping, you understand a lot about what's happening around you. Now, stereotyping is interesting because it's one of those words that, again, is loaded, right? We think of it in bad terms. I say stereotype, and some people think, you know, white hoods and back in the 60s problems, right? We start thinking of sexist comments. We start thinking of these things. But realistically, stereotyping is something the brain does because of the quantity of information we do. It's not going to stop. But if you understand that it's there, you can let it not affect you in a negative way. You can harness its power at times, but you can also step back and understand why people are interacting the way they do. One of the ways is in understanding what matters to other people. Now, I've just talked about stereotyping, and I'm gonna make some gross stereotypes here about us. Who here was at RubyConf Orlando? Who here remembers the bar scene on the last night? Anybody remember why the bar scene was so awkward? There was a suntanning convention in the same convention center that started the day we left. That was a hilarious scene of social psychology right there, because 
you had on one side of the room a bunch of us geeks, laptops, and backpacks, right? And on the other side of the room, you had lots of suntans, lots of built bodies. And on both sides of the room, you had a bunch of, ew. <laughs> and what was funny is, you know, the whole, it, we've seen the geek thing played out in TV over and over again about how certain people feel towards nerds and that kind of thing, revenge of the nerds, right? But what's interesting is our reaction to them as well. And them being, yes, a big group, right? We automatically see people with, who go and get suntans and you know, suntanning beds or, or spray on tans, right? As having less intellect. Geeks tend to very quickly apply a value to people who value different things, right? Or an intellectual issue. We automatically think of somebody less if they value how they appear and what's going on on the outside. It's not true, right? It's a gross generalization. Maybe it's true for some of the people you've met, but does that mean every single person applies that way? You know, some people think the same thing about us in showers. Does that mean everybody here doesn't take a shower? Thank God that's not true. I wouldn't be standing up here, right? Um, not in a closed room, at least. But understanding what matters to other people can help you in, large, in a large way. How does this tie back into sales? Well, one of the examples I like to use is sitting in a meeting. You come into a meeting, and I've, I've seen this happen time and time again. Programmer comes in, person having a problem comes in, she's sitting there in a business, okay, I guess I'm using a she, I'm just pulling this out random. Sitting there in a business suit, Franklin Day Planner in front, very collected, pens put in the right position, this and that. Guy comes walking in, hasn't shaven in a couple days, or maybe he's taking part in November or something. Has a t-shirt on, it's got a picture of Han Solo, it says who shot first. Um, Flip flops, you know, uh, Coke or Starbucks or something, it sits down, puts feet up on the chair. Instantly there's a failure to communicate <laughs> on both sides. If I was up here giving a talk on sales but I decided to wear a suit, well, okay, that's a bad example. Um, if I go in to a meeting with a bunch of geeks, I go into a user group, and I wanna start talking about something, I show up in a suit, the reaction, if, if they don't know me, the reaction is phenomenal. We instantly have a lot of distrust. As a, as a group, we have this, is this weird distrust of, well, wait a minute, what are you trying to trick me over on? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to sell? Right? What, is it, what is it you're pushing? Which is interesting, because when we show up in a Han Solo t-shirt, other people instantly start thinking, Jesus, is this boy ever going to grow up? But we know that who shot first is a really critical argument that happens, right? <laughs> this is a big discussion. This is funny. Somebody walks in in a t-shirt like that to an interview, half of us go, wow, he's got to be good. Right? So understanding that we have these biases is really important. Not because I want you to stop, but I want you to understand that they're happening. Because we value things differently. We don't value them better. Right? Just because they have a suit on doesn't mean they're any less bright. Some harder ones to think about, what do geeks think of people who have right-wing political beliefs? Don't answer that, please. I don't want to start an argument. <laughs> what do geeks think about people who have strong religious beliefs? I know a lot of people who are not big fans of Uncle Bob since he started Twittering. It's pretty sad because it's a different opinion. But we do that, right? And if we understand that we do that, conversations can be much more productive. So this whole thing is simply to tell you, look into it. Read some more about it. Understand some more about what we do. So when you're sitting in a meeting and you're talking to somebody, or you're sitting there and you're trying to tell them about something you have, it's not a matter of value. It's not a matter of being smarter than somebody else. Well, okay, you probably think you're smarter, and nine times out of ten, maybe you are. But that doesn't matter, right? What matters is that we need to communicate, and we need to come a step in their direction. I'm not saying put on a suit, but I'm saying understand why the suit matters to other people, and the conversations can be more productive, okay? The other part of understanding how the brain works as a computer is you can understand the fact that we have bugs in there. 
We have bugs in our brain and we have a defined list of, we have an errata for it. They're called cognitive biases. There's actually a wiki page on them. They're fascinating to read. They're common bugs in the brain. Now, we stereotype all the time, right? I'm telling you this, we, we find abstractions. Well, there's this, and I didn't write it down on the card and it's gonna bite me in the butt. I was hoping it would just come to me at the last minute. Um, but there's a symbolic reduction fallacy. Thank you, I did. Um, there's this one cognitive bias about when you reduce something to a thing of symbols, you miss a lot of the larger part of the scale of what's going on. There's an intense need for, there's another one that's an intense need for closure. We hate open-ended things. Um, well, if there's an intense need for closure, does that explain why we sometimes have trouble convincing people about how good agile development can be? Right? Maybe that's why we're having trouble communicating some of these things. We sit there and we get frustrated because we're like, this is the way it should be done. This is what's there. And they're sitting there going, but, but I don't, is there, are we jumping off the end of a cliff? I don't know. We also need to learn not just psychology, but also spend some time learning how to debate. Get some books on debate. There's some interesting aspects to how to frame arguments and what happens. There's some really interesting exercises that come out of this too. I took competitive speech and debate in high school. No, I was terrible, I got slaughtered. Um, but one of the interesting things we did is when we first got there, we filled out this big long questionnaire on a lot of our personal beliefs on things. It was really hard to answer some things. I mean, there was, there were questions on abortion, there were questions on, and as a teenager, you're, you're there trying to, you don't really wanna write this down, you don't wanna think about a lot of this stuff, but how do you feel about the death penalty? How do you feel about these things? And not knowing what was happening going into the class, I spilled out my heart, right? You get into the class and you immediately had to do debate from the other side. So at the time, um, it's been an interesting progression of my life at where I stand nowadays where I used to in high school, but I got to argue for abortion because I did not believe in it at the time. And so having to do that from the other side was fascinating. So even though you don't believe in it, do it. Doing this helps you. Doing this helps you think about what the other side's thinking about. So if you're out there selling your product or your service, start thinking about why you shouldn't use your product or service. Start thinking about where you, know, where you fall down. Who here can tell me what a straw man argument is? Okay. Exactly. Exactly, you're both right. You're setting up a weaker argument. You're putting up a false, not a false enemy, but you're putting up an enemy, but you're only putting up the certain points that you want to so that you can knock it down later. Understanding how this works can really help us understand how we're framing arguments and things, right? So, hold that thought for just a minute because the next thing is understanding when you're, in, when you're in sales, when you're in a role of persuasion. Understanding the differences between features and benefits is one of the most critical things. If you take nothing else out of here, this is what I want you to remember. Understand the difference between features and benefits. If I see one more talk on a new language where they sit there and show me every single little feature, I'm gonna scream. I see closure talks all the time where they go through and they talk about all these little features of it. Ask yourself the question, so what? For every feature, there's a benefit. If there's not, forget about the feature. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not talking about product planning here, I'm not talking about your product in general. But I'm saying every product, everything that we use, every service that we use has a defined list of features but the people that are coming in to use them are going to be unique. Your job is to understand the match between this feature and this person. So setting up your arguments in straw man form might make you feel better, right? If you come in and talk to me about Git and you start beating up on you know, SVN branching, okay, you're going for the easy win. 
If you're telling me about beautiful code in a keynote and you're showing Python, yeah, okay, you might get a laugh. Are you really convincing anybody of anything? Right? Understand the arguments you're making. Understand how to frame them, but understand how they match. One of the funniest examples was I was in a sales training for, so a little bit of my background. Um, I started off as a geek, went in for one of my first interviews, and it was the most, it was the most deflating thing I'd ever done. The guy barely talked to my feet. He goes to show me this desk I'm gonna be in, and we go through this 10 minute walk of mazes of cubicles where they're like nobody, right? And I go back there and there's computer equipment stacked up and there's this tiny cubicle that's been cleaned off. And I'm looking around, there's not a soul around me. There's a phone on the desk, I'm kinda like, ooh, at least there's a phone. He's like, yeah, but it doesn't ring that often. And here's a computer you're gonna be working at. I'm going, oh my God. In case you haven't noticed, slightly extroverted. So for me, this is like the seventh circle of hell. So despite loving computers, this was not for me. And I looked, yes, I looked at one data point, made an incredible generalization about the entire industry, and went, I'm not doing this. So I left and started trying to find my way. I ended up in hotel sales, of all things. Um, by a series of accidents, I was a secretary at a hotel. My boss came to me one day and says, you're great with customers, you suck at your job. I'm promoting you because otherwise I need to fire you. <laughs> True story. Um, but anyway, so I find myself in hotel sales. I go to um, this training, and it was on the differences of features and benefits. We spent three days talking about this. It was phenomenal. It really made me look at things differently. Well, one of, the f one of the funniest ones they talked about was this lady, and she was, she was the one that did it. She's given the presentation. She's like, yeah, one of my favorite ones was, I'm giving this proposal for this um, association, and I go through, and they had some special requirements they were asking about, and I looked into it, and I knew we could do those and all this, and they come in, the leaders of this association come in for a tour. And I go, and I grab my sales kit, and I'm dressed up, and I've got my demo rooms in hand, and I go walking down, and I show them my favorite feature. We spent all this money on rebuilding the pool, and it was great, it was so beautiful now. It was this beautiful deck there, there was this you know, hot tub, it was, it was big, and I, I'm in there, and you know, we're probably in there for 10 minutes, and you can see the lady like kind of getting antsy, and finally she's like, Deborah, you know we're the Paraplegic Association of America, right? She had spent all this time on, do they have enough ADA rooms, do they have the ability to get around hallways, can they do this in the meeting room? Never made the connection that the fact that you have a pool might be okay for some people, but in general, kind of lost on the whole conference, right? Spending a lot of time talking about this when it could have just, just let it lie. It was a phenomenal example about not understanding your audience. The other one was, I've spent as much time selling Ruby as I have selling Edge Case. Come from the Midwest, Columbus, Ohio, not exactly tech mecca. I'd love it to be, but it's not. So there's still a lot of people that just don't know about what we do. Being the only Ruby shop in town makes it a little bit easier, but in general, the reason we started Edge Case was my fascination and my love for Ruby as a language. My fascination with doing things right. So we start the company and I go out and the more people I can get to use Ruby, if I can fight on the supply side instead of the demand side, I think we're all gonna win. That's been my theory from the beginning. So I go out to conferences and I go into days of .NET. I go into conferences where it's mainly Java. I go into these places because I wanna talk to them about what we're doing. And I saw this interesting thing happen where I had forgotten my sales training. So I'm in there and I'm giving them talks about blocks, I'm giving them these things, and I see these blank stares. And I couldn't figure out why people weren't as excited as I was. But I wasn't thinking about it from their perspective. Sat down one day, completely rewrote my talk. Showed them like four gems and four features. Had more compliments about my talks, had more people communicating with me afterwards about it. And I realized a couple things. And Nathaniel touched on one of them in his talk the other day about something he and I discussed, which is first of all, we're at a conference. I'm not gonna teach you anything in an hour. If you walk away with one or two points, I'm extremely happy. I'm here to steer you in the right direction, to talk about something, and hopefully inspire you. That's it. And I realized I was not doing that in my language talks. So I talk about blocks, and I kind of show them. Then I talk about, or, and then what do I do? I bring up Builder, and I start showing how Builder works. Feature, benefit. Does everybody use Builder all the time? No. But Builder is something they've not seen before. It's thinking about things differently. 
I'd go in, I'd start talking about message passing. I'd start talking about our small talk background. What do I do then? I'd show dynamic finders in Active Record. Do we use act dynamic finders a lot in Active Record? Not usually. But you know what? People who haven't seen that before, people who haven't seen that possibility before, start thinking about it in terms of differently. So understand the differences in features and benefits. And then a couple smaller points. If you're in the sales process, you're in the right state of mind. A couple things you need to learn. One, I've had trouble learning. I still have trouble learning, if anybody knows me. And that is the art of shutting up. Learn when to shut up. The, sales, the hotel sales trading, we were talking about this. And he says, yeah, perfect example. I'm sitting there out there, got this new client, only been doing sales for about a year. I'm trying like hell to win his account. He's there talking about the hotel and he's like, he goes out front and he's like, about this parking thing. And the guy looks up at him and goes, oh yeah, we'll, we'll take care of that for your group. And he stops and he looks, he goes, well, I'll take you up on it, but that's not what I was gonna ask. He was worried that they could fit enough cars in the front at the same time. Now 17 bucks a person for valet parking meant for you know, a 300 person group meant he just gave up a lot of money because he didn't shut up for a second. The second thing was an example where Adam uh, rode with Ken and I, my business partner, down to a sales meeting. This is a few years ago. And we're sitting in a meeting and we're talking about what we can do for them. And we're talking about how we could manage this product, project. And apparently, and we, in retrospect, we realized what happened, it's hilarious. But Ken and I started negotiating with each other. We're on the same side. They're not saying a word, but we feel the need to fill the silence. By the time we left, we probably had you know, $20 less of an hourly rate than we should have. We probably had given them way more than we wanted to. We walk out of there and Ken's like, or Adam looks at me, he's like, man, you guys really suck at this. <laughs> and I start thinking about it, I'm like, he's right. Like, I feel this need to fill silence, right? So little thing to take away, let people talk. Don't talk yourself. And uh, if you know me, that's actually a hilarious statement coming from me. In the end though, everyone needs to know a little bit about sales. You need to be able to sell the product you're working in. You need to have buy-in to what you're doing as a company. I find that extremely important. You need to understand what you're doing. Sales is not always about going out and convincing somebody to spend money. Maybe it's about convincing your, your boss that you really need to go explore Mongo because it's a better option. Well, why is that? Don't set up a straw man argument. Don't give him a list of features. Tell him why he should give a shit. Could be about convincing your wife why you really need an iPad. Features and benefits are gonna be really important there. But understand that we have, as sales, it's the best job you could possibly have. It's a meta job. You know, feeling the first time you ever wrote some meta code? I do. I remember the first meta programming I did, it was in Perl, yeah. But it was so amazing to write code that turned around and wrote code and did something. If you're a parent, if you're not a parent, this is hard to, describe, hard to understand. <clears throat> One of my proudest moments I always thought would be in accomplishments I do, but as a parent I realized the best thing that can happen is watching your kids accomplish something. Having a meta job is amazing. Being able to go out and convince people to use your services there's a feeling like none other. And I'll leave you with one last story until we take questions and answers. It was in the hotel sales. These people come in the door, it's a slow afternoon. These ladies come in and they're like, look, we just need something very different. They were a law firm out of Chicago. They were coming down to have a six week long um, court fight, federal court, six weeks or more. It's gonna be very long. Lots of documents, lots of lawyers. Federal courts were in Cincinnati, Ohio. They basically needed a temporary office. They didn't want to go rent office space because they didn't know how long it was going to be. They come to us. They'd gone to three other hotels who gave them, yeah, you can use this conference room, da, da, da. Now imagine working in an office like this. That would suck, right? And they're basically saying, what can we do? Is there anything we can do? And I sat with them and talked to them and thought about it. And I remember having a conversation at the time I was smoking. I was in the smoke, smoke break area and talking to one of the engineering guys about a bunch of suites we had that we weren't renting because the hotel didn't have the budget for the furniture to completely be able to rent these because you have to have all the furniture in place for, you, for your inspections. And so I'm like, you know what, let's go take a look at those rooms. And so I did something in sales which you're never supposed to do which is take a client into a room that's not ready. But 
we start looking, I'm like, what would the, how would these work? We start looking, they were fascinated by the idea. The rooms needed a couple wall plates and a couple fixtures hanging from the ceiling. That we could have a budget for. So I'm talking to the engineering guys, talking to them. In about three hours, I had this contract worked out. We had 15 lawyers come in and stay in suites for six weeks or more. We rented out these rooms that we're not renting anyway, and we found a solution. We found a positive solution. That was kind of cool. It was one of my proudest moments as a sales, my first real proud moment as a salesperson. And I was put in some shit hotels, so there was not a lot of times of pride at the time. A um, Couple weeks later, they, start, they come in. It's the first day there. Our catering staff worked on a top-down, it was a union, so they had this top-down list. First person most seniority always got the meetings and then they would come in. And so you'd see the certain servers coming in and out, walking around all the time, and then if there was really busy, you'd start seeing people you hadn't seen in a while, right? Nights that we had weddings and things like that, you'd see these people. Well, I'm sitting in a smoke break room and it's during the day, which is usually our slower period. We have probably three servers on. And I see 10 servers walk by. And the last two, I didn't recognize at all. Hadn't seen them before. And I sat there and realized they're there at work on that day because of something I had done. That was a cool feeling. Since then, I've started Edge Case. And if there's anything cooler than raising your hand in the other room that says, you know, you get paid to do rails, it's being able to raise your hand and go, because of me, I'm actually able to pay other people to do rails. That's pretty sweet. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Tomatoes, comments, anything? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Throw something. Actually, I should say that tone, please. Jake. So what was the thing that helped me turn the corner to become more of a salesman in the, in the uh, programming world? It was the mindset. It was the understanding that I'm doing this because I love it. I'm doing this because I feel like we're developing software in a better way than a lot of other places out there. And that I have something to offer them that's gonna help them in the end. And the third thing is just understanding that, maybe it was fourth, I lost count, um, is understanding that we're all in the business world and we need to be doing this. I'm not tricking them into giving me money. I'm not convincing them to buy you know, a, a piece of plastic thing they're gonna regret later. I'm getting them to buy services that I know they're gonna love. And so that was, that was it. Anthony. Yeah, um, so you can project, everybody heard that. Um, I do find myself doing both, and I find them to have been, I found them to be one and the same. You can't do one without the other. You need a message to be able to, to talk to people. You need to understand what it is your product has to offer. Um, and I think marketing to the masses of just, here's my features, is terrible. I think marketing to certain subsets of individuals about what they need to know about your product is what it, what's there. The most powerful messages we hear are about one feature of something for one particular group that cares. And so it's combining that. So I find myself, because we're also a small company, I don't have separate marketing and sales, but yes, there's a lot of direct sales to this, but being able to do direct sales helps me be able to do marketing on a meta level as well, because you're literally hearing from people, you're not trying to guess what it is they're thinking of what you do. So um, I don't think you can separate them, truly. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you just wanted me to talk more, I know. <laughs> that doesn't count. I know. I said yeah, what's up? Can't continue for a long time. Um, the second question is, you talked about shutting up, right? So, and I, the point of shutting up to me is listening. That, that's where you yes. listen to what the other person has to say. When you forget to shut up and you go too far, how do you recover? First of all, you have to deal with the consequences, usually. Because you are, you throw an offer out there, you can't just retract it. Um, not usually. Um, I, I don't know if there's legal implications with it, but as, a, as an honest person, if, I'm, if I throw something out there, I have to stand behind it. I want to. <clears throat> so a lot of times it's dealing with the consequences of what you've done. Um, other times it's you know, fumbling and trying to figure out what's there. Um, I, don't know, I, I don't know how to answer that as a, as a whole like, 
Here's the magic answer. But um, there's different ways of dealing with it. Would you admit to it? Or would you say, would, or would you try to work back into a line that is more, that, that is more favorable to where you want to go? So if it's about persuasion, would you try to persuade them back into the, where you want the, the deal ultimately to go? Or would you admit to, you know, oh, you know what, I overstepped my bounds on that, or I should, you know, how do you approach that? In, in if it's something that I can't stand behind, um, then yeah, I would, you know, you'd have to go to them and just be honest with, I overstepped my bounds, here's what we need to do. Um, but otherwise, um, learn from the mistake you've done, and maybe that's right there, something you can correct, but maybe that's something where you have to give up on what you did here and just know next time. So some key elements that we do is A, I don't talk about rate until it's absolutely necessary in a conversation, because not everybody that's calling us is first concerned about what rate they're paying us. Number two, there's always a timed element to everything we do. And that was a lesson that I had to learn because we had some people paying rates where we decided we were not where the market was. In fact, we were off by a large percentage. And so we increased our rates and we didn't have a timed element to our contract. So there's, there's that ability. And then yes, being honest with them, going to them and saying, we're all in business together. It's been two years. We need to talk about this. And usually people are willing to have those kind of conversations. How do you sell to an opinionated audience that um, has a solution in mind but you don't think is the right solution? Well, first of all, not thinking that's the right solution is good, um, but make sure you frame it in the positive. Don't spend a lot of time telling them why their solution sucks. Spend some, a lot of time showing what your solution does and talking about your solution. I don't spend a lot of time talking about why waterfall programming is terrible for you. I don't spend time telling you why skipping testing is awful. I don't spend time telling you why I think a cobbled together Drupal-like WordPress-ish solution is gonna be a bad thing. I spend time talking about what we can do, but first of all, believing in it. Because the other thing is being able to walk, understanding when you need to walk away. If you don't believe that's a, you're a better solution, you're just trying to convince them to use you, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong talk. You need to, I mean, not here, but you know, you're, in the, you're in the wrong conversation, right? And so um, understanding, um, having a passion for what you're doing and truly believing in it are the first steps. The rest of it will fall in place. And then if they don't use you, try to ask them why and learn from it next time. In sales, you can iterate the same way you can in software. With people, you can iterate the same way you can in software. I didn't know what I was doing when I built the business. When we started Edge Case, I had no idea what I was doing. Still to some degree, don't know a lot of what I'm doing, but we're iterating on it. Understand where you fell down, understand what you did wrong, and correct it next time. How do I convince people to go to hourly without fixed bid fe fixed features? Much larger conversation, <laughs> um, but it does start off with, first of all, understand that you're not trying to trick them, you're not trying to win one over on them, but truly, this is a better solution. You know, I've gone to people and said, I'm not going to lie to you and pretend that I know exactly what this is going to take. I will do some business analysis in the sales cycle to kind of try to get an idea if it's bigger than a bread box, right? Because you know, is it going to be a $20,000 solution? Is it going to be a $200,000 solution? Or is it somewhere in the middle? But second of all, identify the big risks. If you can point them three areas where this could be a can of worms, that's usually enough to show them what's going on. And then second, and then last thing is, I try to tell them, I'm not asking you to spend $200,000 with me. I'm asking you to spend X amount of dollars per, you know, at a time. And so, and there's a lot more things we do that, that go into that too, uh, being remote and all that, but that's a lot of that. So, I'm out of time. If you have any other questions, find me. Thanks for coming.